Welcome to the Leaders Room. I'm Ripa Rashid of the ICLIF Center for Leadership and Governance. Today, I'm delighted to welcome to the studio Dr. Dean Radin. Dr. Radin is a world-renowned expert in the field of consciousness research. Over the last 30 years, Dr. Radin has led a series of breakthrough experiments into the phenomenon of the advanced capacities of the human mind. He has most recently authored a book entitled Supernormal, and prior to that, books entitled with fascinating names such as The Conscious Universe and Entangled Minds. Dr. Radin, welcome to the Leaders Room. Thank you very much. Well, let's start at the beginning. What led you to the field of consciousness research? Well, I think as a child, I read too many fairy tales and a little bit too much science fiction. Uh, as, as we know, uh, years ago when the Harry Potter series became a worldwide phenomenon, that uh, children in particular, but also adults, became enthralled with the idea of the stories. Mm -hmm. And of course, the stories are talking about magic, and magical thinking is, is a part of, seems to be hardwired into the human psyche. So I read the equivalent at, at the time when I was a child and naturally became curious about whether those stories had any truth in them at all. And even as a child, of course, you recognize that these are fantasies. But there's something compelling about certain kinds of stories, parables, mythology, that it seems like it's more than just a story. It's, it's a symbolic uh, teaching about something else, something bigger. So uh, either I never grew up, and I'm still a child at heart, and I still have the same underlying curiosity about these things, uh, or as a result of being a scientist and looking into them and finding that some of the stories actually do seem to have an underlying truth to them, uh, I've stuck with it. So that's, that's the area of consciousness research that attracted my attention long ago and still does today. Well, you started off as a professional violinist. Then you got a degree in engineering, so you're clearly a polymath. Um, but was there a turning point? Was there one particular experience that led you to this field? No. No? No. I, I ask this question often because I'm, I'm working in a field that is considered controversial. I'm, I study primarily psychic phenomena in the laboratory, uh, and not very many people are doing this. So the natural assumption is that I come from a family that is, reports like lots of psychic experiences or I've had my own experiences, and that's actually not the case at all. I, when I grew up, I don't remember anyone ever talking about these kinds of phenomena. Uh, the closest we probably got to it is that my mother was practicing yoga, as I recall, when I was a young child. And so there were books around the house about the, the masters of the Far East and stories uh, that to me were very similar to the fairy tales I was reading as a child. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know if it was true or not, but it was very foreign in terms of not being part of my experience. Mm -hmm. What caught my attention though was you have the stories. I was also always interested in science and engineering besides playing music. What caught my attention was as a probably a 10 or 11 years old, I discovered that there was a branch of science that was actually looking carefully at these kinds of phenomena not so much to, to look at it from a magical point of view, because magic is magic. It's like not, it's beyond science. But more that these are ordinary human experiences that are reported all around the world and have been throughout history. And could it be studied using the tools of science? And I discovered that the answer was yes. That's what caught my attention. And so that's, I decided that that would look really interesting. And I started dabbling in it and decided at some point, probably around college, that if it was possible to have a career where you're using the tools of science and applying it to that particular area of human capacity, that's what I wanted to do. And today, you're the chief scientist of the Institute of Noetic Sciences, IONS, a great acronym. But tell us, what does noetic science mean? What does the word noetic mean? Noetic comes from the Greek root word nous, N-O-U-S which doesn't have an exact translation into many languages, but the, about the closest we can come to in English is deep intuitive knowing. And this is in contrast to rational or analytical knowing. Mm 
So that in, at least in, in the Western scientific model, the, we figure things out analytically. We break them down. We use reason and mathematics to understand how things work. And that is definitely a way to know. But there are other ways of knowing. So intuition is a way of knowing. Uh, a, a mystical insight is a way of knowing. Dreams are a way of knowing. There's, there's a much larger a universe of ways of knowing than we normally think about or, or even teach in school. And so our institute is devoted to using all ways of knowing to study knowing itself, especially intuitive ways of knowing. Well, one of the terms that has um, come into the public through your work is this concept of mass consciousness or collective consciousness. What does that mean? Tell us a little more about some phenomenon around mass consciousness. Well, actually, the idea of a collective consciousness, either collective consciousness or collective unconsciousness, is traced back to the people like the Jesuit scholar uh, Teilhard de Chardin, who spoke about this many years ago. Uh, Carl Jung, of course, talked about the mm -hmm. archetypal uh, elements in the collective unconscious. So it's not a new yes. idea. What is new is that we have tools now that allow us to test whether there is such a thing. I mean, there is in the sense that uh, marketeers are always taking advantage of, of moving the mass mind mm -hmm. so that we buy this potato chip rather than that potato chip. Uh, what we're talking about here, though, is more like, uh, is there some unusual capacity for people's minds to meld? And, and when people wonder, well, what do I want to talk about? Anybody who's been involved in a sports team or a chorus group or an orchestra or something involving a team work where the team has to work together in order for it to succeed at whatever it's doing, occasionally the team gets into a kind of a zone where individuality melts into the collective mm -hmm. and it feels very different when that happens. There's some mm -hmm. energetic feeling or flow or something that everybody knows and no one, has, no one knows what it is. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a, a state of flow, and so a few psychologists have studied this internal state. It feels really good. When it happens, the capacity of the group is much, much better than it is without that feeling of flow. So a big part of, of teaching teams on how to, to work as a team is to get people into this level of coherence where the flow occurs. So we wondered, does this strange sense of internal energy that happens, the flow sense, is that a real thing or, or what? Uh, so we've, we've started a number of experiments, mostly started by a colleague at Princeton University. And I've continued that. And we have now colleagues around the world who are studying, is there an actual physical change in the environment that could be measured as a result of a group that gets into a flow state? And to, to make a long story short, the answer is yes we can see that there are physically measurable changes that occur when a group is working together coherently. The other piece I found fascinating about some of your work is when a global catastrophe happens, such as the earthquake in Japan. You've done some fascinating work in that area of responses in the collective consciousness. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, for about 14 years now, we've had a program called the Global Consciousness Project. This was started by Roger Nelson at Princeton. Uh, he's now retired, but the program is continuing. Uh, it consists of probably 100 colleagues around the world, each of whom has uh, a little electronic device called a random number generator. Uh, these devices are designed so that each random bit that it produces is completely independent of every random other bit. So it's a true random sequence. Mm -hmm. And all these devices do is just spit out random bits all the time. Uh, the project is asking the question as to whether or not there is a global shift in attention as a result of large scale events. So earthquakes, acts of terror, things of that sort, that, that the, the world media shifts. And so in some respect, a large proportion of the world's attention also shifts, and it shifts more or less in proportion to how big the event is, or the import of the event. So what we do is we either wait for an event to happen that was unpredicted, or in some cases there are predicted events, like, like New Year's Eve celebrations and other big celebrations. Uh, 
and we specify beforehand that this event, before we look at the data, this event looks like it'll be a two-hour event or a four-hour event or some are sometimes one-day event. And since we have random data coming from these devices, coming in from all around the world in different major cities, we're able to get what amounts to a network of randomness. And we use randomness because the hypothesis here is that mind and matter are not really that different. And so if you have a very sudden change of attention in the mental world, around the world, you get this unusual period of large coherent moments that maybe that mental movement will be reflected by a matter movement. So the matter in this case is the output of these physical devices, the random number generators. We use randomness because it's very easy to detect order when it arises in randomness. It also it turns out to be very compatible with, with digital technology and using the internet to collect the data and all the rest of it. So we have events, a large-scale event. We define the length of the event, and then we look in the random data for all of these generators around the world to see if the randomness goes away. And there's a number of different ways we can look for that. The, the one that's most interesting is, let's say we have 50 random generators going at any given time. An event occurs, a big earthquake, it attracts a lot of attention. Uh, we then say, okay, we'll look at the four-hour piece of, of data when the earthquake struck, and that's when people learn about it. Do the random generators around the world become coherent between themselves. You have 50 generators, there are lots of pairs of correlations that you can look at. They shouldn't be correlated. Every bit is independent of every other random bit, but if they do become correlated, that would suggest something like a, a tsunami in the sense of a huge wave is arising in the physical environment. The wave we're talking about here is one that is the opposite of entropy. It's, it's the opposite of randomness, it's order. We call that neg entropy. There's a rise of neg entropy that affects the entire world. That's a hypothesis. You can see that in the data. So as of uh, 2013, we're, we're in uh, November now, we have about 450 events that we've looked at over the, the past 14 years. And the odds against chance for what we're seeing here are many, many trillions to one against chance that we're, we're seeing order arising. Uh, so we know that the order that we're seeing is not a chance event. It, is, it really is a big change that's occurring. No, I'll take that back. It's not big in terms of magnitude, but in terms of the statistic certainty of what's going on, we have extremely high certainty that there is a change in randomness that is correlated to these large-scale events. So the probability is extremely low for what you're seeing. For those who are scientists or statisticians, we're talking about a seven sigma result. Well, what causes the shift in the random numbers? What causes those patterns? We don't know. So here's a, an example of uh, when uh, science begins oftentimes by a hypothesis, and you test it, and you get data. And so we can show that the hypothesis is correct in the sense that there is a correlation. We're seeing some correlation that people have written out about in philosophical terms. When it comes to an explanation, we have to then think, well, what kind of an explanation would be satisfactory? Usually what we mean by an explanation is a reductionistic explanation, that this, this thing caused that and that caused that, and you know, mechanistic reductionism, that's how we think about explanations. That may not be possible in this case, because we're talking about a, a truly holistic phenomenon. It seems to span the entire world. It involves mind and matter interacting in some way. We have no idea how that could happen. It is not the case, however, that there are no theories. There are some theories about how these things work, but the, the level of precision and the level of testability of these theories is yet not, not well developed. So I can give you some speculations as to what I think is happening, but they're, they're not at the level where everybody would say, oh yes, that seems like a viable theory. It's just a speculation. So how much of an overlap is there between what you're doing and the traditional field of neuroscience? Well, if, when we do studies that involve the tools of neuroscience, there's no difference at all. When we do studies that involve other kinds of instrumentation, then it's, it's not like neuroscience, it becomes more like physics or it becomes more like statistics, or more like cognitive psychology. So we use, we use many different techniques depending on what it is that we're studying. Mm 
if we're looking at uh, issues about how does the brain respond uh, given different kinds of capacities that people have, then we're using exactly the same tools as the neurosciences use. Well, your work over the years has attracted so much attention, both positive and negative. You've had um, a lot of skeptics coming to you. Do you find certain parts of the world are more receptive to this type of research than elsewhere? I'll put it this way, that the nature of the taboo exists everywhere, and we call it sometimes the woo-woo taboo. The woo-woo taboo is, the woo-woo is a, a term that is sometimes used to describe the spooky paranormal things. Uh, and there, there's a taboo, and in the classic sense of a taboo, that there are certain things you don't talk about in public. So in Western science, very strong. You don't talk about this. That doesn't mean that people privately won't talk about it. In fact, I have yet to find anybody, I mean literally anyone that I have spoken to, including people who are extremely skeptical, who won't, when they get comfortable with you in private, begin to admit that some th strange things have happened to them and they don't know how to explain it. And maybe it's psychic and maybe it's something else. But then they will not talk about it in public. And so they, it's, the taboo is, prevents the public discussion. And yet everywhere in the world, people have these experiences. Some cultures, it's more open about it, to talk about it. The tab I would say the taboo, even, even in cultures that are more open to these things, within the scientific subcultures, it becomes more difficult to talk about. So I'll give you an example from uh, uh, when I talk about this to audiences in the United States, technical or scientific audiences, most of the time it's standing room only. So we're talking about people whose jobs is to be professionals in whatever area of science they're in. They're all fascinated by it. Why? Be it, even though none of them are actually doing any research on it, they're fascinated because they're humans. And these experiences happen to humans a lot. In other cultures, like in India, when I speak, again, the, the rooms are overflowing with interest from scientists and non-scientists. And I ask the scientists, the culture here is much more open to these kinds of phenomena. Why aren't you studying it? And the response is that the nature of scientific disciplines is so fractured at this point because science has expanded so much that you can only specialize in a very tiny slice. So there is a slice. There's a discipline of science that studies this. But it is very, very, very small in terms of the number of people. Uh, there are approximately 17,000 institutions of higher learning around the world, of which approximately 40 have one or more faculty members who has publicly expressed an interest in this topic. So 40 individuals out of 17,000 institutions means there's not a lot of action going on above board. Below board, meaning people aren't talking about it, there's much, much more interest and some action as well truly a nascent science in, in, from what you say. Um, is there more interest outside of academic um, spheres, for instance, coming from traditionally places like the US government? Tell us a little bit about, I know you've been involved with some of the work the government has done. Stargate, I believe, is the project. Can you tell us a little bit, whatever's not classified? Well, I'm, I've worked in that program a long time ago. Most of it is now declassified. Uh, I'm not involved in that anymore. So if there is classified work, I'd, I wouldn't know about it. So I don't know. Uh, that, but uh, to, I'll answer your question, but I'll, I'll broaden it a little bit. So outside of the academic world, the academic world already, as compared to everyday life, is already a very strange place to begin with. So it lives on ideology. Like the, all of science lives on ideas not ideology in a negative sense, but simply it's, it's all about ideas. So if you bring in an idea that challenges other ideas, of course, it's looked at askance at minimum. But among the general public, it, this has always been a topic of very high interest around the world. And that we see that very clearly by the way that it's reflected in the entertainment business. Yes. So every, every entertainment type of business, whether it's television or movies or books, is saturated with these topics. Unfortunately, most of it is saturated in the sense of being a horror genre, and which I think is unfortunate, because it doesn't have to be that, but that's simply the way that it's expressed. So 
that would only be there if there is public interest. And, and we know that's there. We know that scientists are human, mostly. We know that people in government are kind of human. And, and so, so the, the human mm -hmm. element is always going to be interested in this. It's expressed in different ways. In the government, and now we're talking about 20 years ago in the United States, uh, there was some interest in seeing if uh, uh, some of these capacities could be used for espionage. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, it fits nicely. It's ESP, extrasensory perception, but in this case, it's esp espionage. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, very talented uh, clairvoyants were used to mostly spy on the Russians. This was during the Cold mm -hmm. War. And every means that was possible was being used to see if you can get intelligence about what was going on, usually in places where other means of intelligence was not working. So if you had a spy satellite and you could look down and see a strange looking building and there was no human intelligence in the vicinity, then they would go to this program and say, tell us what's in that building. And actually, they didn't even go that far. In order to keep it completely blind, what was developed was, uh, here is a number. It might be a 10-digit ten, ten number. Tell us about the 10-digit number. And of course, the number is an association to a target that they know about. But all that the clairvoyant would know, when they're called remote viewers, was the number. The number is linked to something meaningful. So this sounds like an impossible task, but the, the fact is that in this mental space that the uh, clairvoyant can get the number and know that it somehow is linked to this meaningful other thing. So their job is to sketch or to speak or, or to somehow convey information about what is inside the particular building. That was successful enough to keep that program going at a top secret level for over 20 years. And it was used by virtually every branch of the intelligence services, most of the military services, most of the other government services in the United States because it worked. So there you go. On the other hand, it was always classified. And one of the reasons, I think, in, in hindsight, that it was valuable to be classified is because then, as is, as is now, there's a very high skepticism among, uh, actually, people in the government and also in the, among scientists that it even exists. So if you think about this, that the strategic value of a method is strongly linked to whether other people think it exists. That's the whole power of a secret. So you have a secret method that works, that's giving information, not 100%, no, no information source is 100%, but it was val usable, usable information. And it was valuable because basically nobody else thought it was even possible. Really a case of truth being stranger than fiction. Yes. Yes? Dean, you've written extensively about phenomena such as telekinesis, clairvoyance, Tell us, are there certain types of people that are better at this, that have certain innate skills um, at these abilities than others? Definitely, yes. Uh, the way to think about it is uh, you could have asked the same question about musical talent or about sports talent. And there is a talent in this realm. Uh, some people are much better at it than others. But again, similarly to music or sports talent, everyone has the capacity to do something. So with practice, with, with a couple of tips and tricks, uh, there are ways for people to Im improve their ability. Uh, a related question, though, may be, uh, it, since this is an inherent human ability, it has something to do with sentience alone. Like it's, not, it's not even necessarily a human ability. It's something about the fabric of reality and sentience mixed together. This is why this works. And it's not magic. It's not. I mean, we, we might think of it as magic because we don't have an explanation yet, but eventually we will, and then it, you know, it's no longer in the realm of magic. So it's something about sentience, it's something about recursion, it's something about the innate the fabric of reality and the entanglement of all things. Some people are just tuned into that to a much greater degree. What happens when people do have that ability? Do they know it? Some do and some don't. So the ones typically who are very successful in whatever field they happen to be in. It might be business, it might be a movie producer, it might be an author, it might be a scientist. They tend to be much, much better objectively when tested at things like precognition and clairvoyance than people who are not so successful. 
this doesn't this shouldn't be surprising because the the whole point of many of these kinds of phenomena is that somehow you're able to gain information that is not coming through the ordinary channels it's not coming through the ordinary senses it's not something you learned you're somehow pulling it out of the atmosphere obviously if you're an inventor that's that's a good thing to have if you're a business executive and have to make decisions without sufficient information it's very important to be able to somehow outguess the future so there is a study that was done in the mid 1970s among business executives to measure their precognition using a standard precognition test where they simply had to guess a hundred numbers that would later be selected randomly by a computer and that would then form a precognition objective measure for them and then that was correlated against the profit of their businesses and the hypothesis was well maybe the reason why some executives are much more successful is because they actually have a little bit of talent in this area and the correlation should be positive and indeed there is a significant positive correlation between the degree to which you can objectively measure precognition in somebody who's making important business decisions and their profit. So that's, that's just in business. Uh, in other realms, like, like in uh, a movie producer is a good example, they're making huge money decisions based on a, usually on a gut feeling. You know, like this, this movie seems good somehow. The, one, the, the producers that are very successful at that will privately admit that they rely very heavily on their intuition because that's all they have to rely on after some point. Uh, and the ones who are systematically making the right choices time after time, they also then privately will talk about their whole range of other kinds of psychic experiences. But again, they don't, it, in business and in the movies and science, people don't tend to talk about this in, in public. But privately, there's, I think, um, more people than we would suspect who know that they rely on their intuition, and they know that that is linked in some way to getting insight and information in ways that, that don't make any conventional sense, but make a lot of sense when we think about psychic or mystical experience. The word intuition is an interesting one, because I think there is a little more comfort with that term right. than many of the other terms that we've spoken here today. Um, such as precognition or clairvoyance or telepathy. Um, tell me, have you um, done some studies in the animal realm? I haven't, but I've had colleagues who have looked at uh, certainly dogs. Rupert Sheldrake's probably best known for doing experiments on whether dogs can sense when their owners are coming home. And his studies show quite clearly that, that they can do that. But there are other studies using birds, typically parrots, but not exclusively parrots. Uh, some cats, some uh, animals like ferrets, uh, all the way down to earthworms have been used in experiments. So in each case, uh, depending on how the experiment is crafted, uh, you can show that it seems to be even a talent among animals. Some animals are better at it than others. So there's some natural capacity that expresses in humans as talent and in animals as different capacities or different levels of capacity. Not all dogs can correctly sense when their owners are coming home, but some of them are superstars at it. So as I said before, this has something to do with entities that are sentient, that are complex enough like us and like animals. Uh, and, and the reason why I think all of this works we, you know, we use terms like precognition and telepathy. We use those terms as, as markers or descriptions of the way that the phenomena is manifesting. But that doesn't mean that telepathy is a separate thing. It really isn't, I think. It's simply a way that a phenomenon manifests. The nature of the phenomena we're talking about has to do with the way that information is connected through space and time, ultimately. It's, like a, it's really a physics question. Once the information gets into the organism, it's processed by, probably, by psychology and neuroscience and all the rest. The mystery is, how did information, which seems to be beyond the ordinary reach of space-time, how did it get in there in the first place? That's a question for physics. And when you start looking at the deep physics here, you immediately bounce into flexible space-time through relativity, through non-local connections and quantum mechanics. And if you, you simply thought, well, if we know that the underlying structure of, of the physical reality 
has strange connections that span through space-time, then why should we be so, so surprised that people report experiences like that? And the reason we're surprised is because we somehow think of the deep physical structure as not being where we live. You know, this, this seems like hard stuff. This doesn't seem quantum at all. But ultimately, we know that all physicality is quantum in, in nature. And quantum phenomena, among other things, have a non-local property. It's, it, ultimately, you go down deep enough into a physical structure, it is actually not in space-time. Space-time is something that we construct mentally. So I think what we're seeing then in all of these phenomena, and we're talking about all psychic phenomena, some aspects of intuition, uh, some aspects of mystical experience, and maybe even religious epiphanies. This whole spectrum is an experience of a deep structure of the physical world, which is actually before space-time arises. And since our language, we don't, we don't live there very much in our consciousness, our language fails. And that's why it seems so spooky. But that's, that, in fact, is where we're living. And that's where I think these phenomena come from. Um, in closing, I want to ask you about your legacy. Uh, one of the in-depth pieces about you in the New York Times had a title, They Laughed at Galileo Too. It's hard to be a pioneer. Yeah. Fast forward 100, even 500 years, what will be your Dean Radin's legacy to humankind? How do you want to be remembered? I see myself as standing on the shoulders of giants. And so in the future, I will just be one other person that somebody else is standing on, I hope. What it, so in terms of a legacy, what I hope is that people see each of us, and I'm talking about maybe 100 or 200 people going back hundreds of years now who have had an interest and did something in a scientific way to try to pull, up, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps to learn what, what are these phenomena, how do we understand them. I hope that, that uh, I'm seen basically as another little notch, a little advancement in knowledge, is, which involves development of new techniques, maybe ways of expressing it, and that sort of thing, and also pulling it out of this silly taboo that has prevented people from, from doing no more than simply discussing this in scientific forums in a serious way. So, if anything, I, I hope that maybe I, people would look back and say, oh, he's the guy who made science more tolerant of the discussion. That would be good enough. That certainly would. Thank you, Dean, for joining us here today in the Eclipse Leaders Room. Dean Radin has certainly given us a great deal to think about today, about the links between reality and the mind. Thank you for joining us in today's session of the Leaders Room. I'm Reepa Rashid of the Eclipse Center for Leadership and Governance.